Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. We're going to do this in Spanish. <clears throat> I'm just kidding. Si. Sí. Okay. So we're in Peru. We're trying to speak Spanish. Everything was like, si, sí, with an accent. Okay. Bathroom. Anyways, we are in this... We've been talking about God's faithfulness. A lot of the folks have been coming, Pastor Joel, Jeremiah, um, uh, what's his name, Rick, Pastor Joel's dad. <laughs> he came over and talked about the faithfulness of God, which is really good. So can I kind of flipped it, though. I was like, what are the things that God uses to make your faith strong? Because God wants your faith, he wants you strong in faith, right? He wants you strong in faith. Your faith and your trust. Another way to put faith is trust. All he wanted to do with Adam was just trust me, Adam. I got all this stuff for you. Just stay away from that. But he chose to listen to the voice of someone else other than God. And he got himself in trouble. Lost confidence. He messed it all up. Jesus had to come and redeem that. And redeem trust. And now the Holy Spirit is working daily in our lives to help us understand that, hey, you can trust him. He is faithful. Scripture says that the just will live by faith. We're to walk by faith and not by sight, correct? Jesus admired. He says that he marveled. I talked about last week. He marveled at a couple of things. He marveled at a centurion's faith. This is a Roman centurion who had never even seen him. If you look at that passage, you'll notice that he sent people before him. He never got to see him, but he trusted him. And he was like, he was blown away. He goes, that man's got great faith. He also marveled at the people that did know him in his own hometown. Because they should have known better, but because they knew him, they couldn't trust him. Not because he was a bad person, because they lacked and says he could there do no mighty works because there was no faith in there. They were just looking at him in the natural. The scripture says that we are to fight the good fight of faith. The fight that you're fighting now is not against your wife or your cousin or your boss. Don't put a face to your fight. The fight that you fight is the fight to remain in faith. That when you read God's word, he is what he said he is. And you can put your trust in him that he will be that person. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> fight the good fight. He, as a matter of fact, Jesus said, you're, he's the author and the finisher of your faith. Hebrews eleven six 6, it says that without faith, it's impossible to please him. And so he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Jesus is talking to a parable. He's telling about a parable of, of, of the widow woman, her persistence in her faith. And at and, and the very end, he says, you know what? God's going to do that. If you, if you come to me persisting that to, to hold me accountable to my own word, he goes, I will come and I will avenge you. He goes, but when Jesus returns, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find those individuals who are putting their trust in him? It's a great question. I don't know about you, but my whole goal and my whole attitude as a pastor is to try to create scripture, try to create a lane so that when we're teaching you, you will get stronger in your trust and your confidence in God. Amen. That's my hope as a pastor. Amen. I know it doesn't come overnight. It doesn't come. It just takes discipline. Just week by week, week by week, day by day, doing this over and over again. As a matter of fact, that's one of the ingredients that he uses is discipline. Just habits matter in our lives. Correct? <clears throat> Are you guys out there? Yeah. Well, fantastic. Now, isn't this true? When you see people... Who, um, whose faith leads them to trust God despite of their circumstances. Don't you think those kind of folks are the most strongest people in your life? Like when you see it's like, man, these guys have gone through all kinds of stuff, but they are still remaining strong. They're, those are some of the strongest folks that we will ever meet. Isn't that true? And I love that. And what is it? I always love folks who've just, who are older in their walk with God and um, maybe they're not working anymore, they're retired or whatever, but I love hanging around just talking to them, just have a coffee with them because I'm like, man, there's stuff on the inside of them that I need, to, I need to glean from, I need to get some wisdom from. And it's important to not neglect them. Oh, they're old, they're old farts. Or not, maybe not, you can call them that, but they're just old. Man, lean into that. And you know what? 
honestly, when you find out, when you sit down and talk to them, they want to do that. They want, they want to share their life experiences and those, those moments in their life to, to try to help you not take any shortcuts. Right. It's like, hey, man, just stay steady. Just keep doing this. Just stay strong. You'll overcome these things. I'm trusting God should be a very common thing in your vocabulary. It's not going to be like, I don't know, man. I don't know. Last time I trusted him, he didn't do this. He didn't do that. And we look to him like he's some kind of a slot machine. Hey, God, you do this. I'll do this if you do this. It doesn't work that way. Christianity is, is not a democracy where you get to vote. Christianity is a kingdom. And we have a king. And when the king speaks, you obey. Amen. Period. Whether you understand or not. Right. So many times. Marcus, go back home to Seguin and start this church. I don't want to. I, that's what I told him. Like, but it's not about me. It's about the king speaking. It's like, okay, obviously somewhere on the other side of this obedience, I'm going to grow and I'm going to need this in my life. And we put our trust and just step out in faith. But that should be very common in your life. So we we're, we're, we're asked the question yesterday, uh, last week, what is it that God uses to fuel and develop uh, enduring faith? What does he use? And we looked at, I came out here with a hat and all this kind of crazy stuff, and I began to cook. I'm not going to cook this week because that cookie didn't taste that good. <laughs> but we said, we, we talked about five things that God uses to develop. In other words, when you look at the life of Jesus as a whole, how he interacted with the, the how he interacted with the disciples, how he interacted with individuals in the scriptures, you'll see these common ingredients over and over again. Plus, when you've been doing it for 38 years, just looking at people and watching them and coming in and out of church and in and out of their faith, sometimes people drift away from their faith. And so I, I perk up. I was like, what is it that caused that? What is it? Why did they do that? What offense? A lot of times it's just offense in a church. Anybody ever been hurt by church people? Welcome to the New Testament. It happens. I'm usually more hurt by people who are followers of Jesus than those who are not followers of Jesus. We got people that don't know the Lord and they're just going crazy and they're shooting the finger at you and they're doing all kinds of stuff. It's like, ah, eh, they're just living out of their nature. No big deal. I could take them. But the Christians are like, man, come on, you guys. You know better than that. That's what's difficult. But we talked about some of the ingredients that we see, come, the common denominators that we see in people walking. Listen, this might be an easy message, but this is so valuable in your walk. As a pastor, you will need to go through these things over and over. And this right here, it's not a checklist. Check. I got that year one. I got that year three. You'll see. I, I, I woke up this morning with a picture. And the picture was that of a bowling alley, a bowling lane. I was on the bowling lane. But I had, I had those rubber things on the, on the side. The bumpers, yes. What do you call those things? So it doesn't matter where you throw it. It's like, dang, 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 dang. It's like, yeah, I did it. Well, that's kind of what I saw. And these things are, you're going to be bumping in and out of these things a lot. And you'll notice in this season of your life, you might need the courage but these are the ingredients, the common things that God will use to help you develop strong, enduring faith. You need to be an individual who's committed to long-term, to have a long shelf life in your walk as a follower of Jesus. Amen. Your grandkids need that. They need to see that. Your kids need to see that. Your great-grandkids need to see that. One of the most faithful, committed, strongest men I know is my dad. Just steady as a rock. Like, dang, Dad, your life is so boring. <laughs> but when hell and high water hit the last couple of years, man, the rock is still there. And it was so good to see that. Because I wanted to do other things. But, man, watching him as an example really has helped my faith and my walk with him. It's a beautiful thing. So we looked at this first one. It says Doing. Somewhere in your story, somebody came to you as a pastor, a church, or an individual. They began to teach you what it was to not only read God's word, but to how to practically apply God's word so that you can begin doing God's word. It's one thing to believe. Even the demons believe. 
Jesus said, somehow or another, your believing has to translate into behaving. Good. Right? Pastor, you need to talk about the gifts. You need to talk about tongues and interpretation and prophecy. I'm like, dude, what is it if I do that? If I do that, what is that? What is, how is that going to help you? So you speak in tongues, but you can't treat your wife right. Somehow your believing has to translate into doing and behaving, right? So doing is a very important part. Some of us are right here on the cusp of actually, you know, doing this part that he's asking us to do. Forgive. Forgive your pastor. Forgive Pastor Joel. You know how honorary he can get. <laughs> the other thing is courage. It takes courage to step out in faith. A lot of us have been in this situation where you have got the, the, the command to do, and then you're right there, but it takes courage to step out and to begin to do that. But he's asking you to do that. It's like, well, I don't know if I, let me have the next step before I take the first step. Faith doesn't work that way. Faith just takes the next step that he's asking you to do. We always want the second step before we take the first one. But what you'll notice is that when you take that first one, ah, the second one is there. Then you just keep going. That's why I coined this phrase, as you go, you will know. And that is so true. Pastor, what's, what's going to happen? I was like, I don't know. I said, but I will know. I don't know now, but I will. Because <clears throat> sometimes it says that the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Well, I don't get any direction. It's like, well, you ain't stepping then. Once you step, sometimes you'll know that it's a no. And no is just as much a leading as a yes, right? So, so some of us just need the courage. Like, you know you're supposed to start that business. You know you're supposed to start that group. You know you're supposed to start that ministry. Whatever it is, you know you're supposed to do this, but now it's going to take courage to step out and do it. It was like, but I don't, I don't understand. I don't have, you know, like, yeah, just keep, you'll keep making those same things in your brain until the timing is gone. So we'll need courage. Now, the third thing that we didn't talk about and we'll look at today is this, is connection. You guys okay? Yeah. Say, I love my pastor. <laughs> okay, good. I love you too. All right. So, so another common thing that you'll see is this right here is all of a sudden, in my walk with, with Jesus, all of a sudden, man, God dropped this person into my life. Man, I would not be where I would be if it wouldn't have been for so-and-so. Anybody ever have those kind of folks in your life? And again, individuals in your life um, at one time won't be there in the next season of your life. During this season of my life, the connection, the people that I'm mostly grateful for, other than my spouse, are these two men right here. Pastor Jeremiah and Pastor Joel, they just are refreshing to me. They're a blessing to me. Jeremiah gives me a hard time a little bit more than Joel. But <laughs> I'm just getting to know him. When I heard his story the other day, I'm like, that's why he acts that way. <laughs> He's crazy. But these men, listen, I don't know if you know this or not. I'm just going to toot their horn or whatever. We are blessed in this church. I mean, seriously, we've got some tremendous gifts that are leading this ministry. Pastor Joel, he could go anywhere in the world and get six figures. Pastor Jeremiah, he can go anywhere in the world and they'd hire him. Don't even think about it. I mean, seriously, these guys are amazingly gifted. I'm like, what the heck? I thought ACDC was here. I was like, I was rocking out this morning. Thunder. Anyways, I'm getting off. But these men are, are vitally important. In my, they make my job as a pastor a whole lot easier. We talk maybe once a week or so. Next thing I know, it's already, it's happening. They're, part, they're, they're doing their part. They're, they're faithful to their part. They're doing it well. They're doing it. Uh, in a way that honors God, and they're doing it because they love you, and they're going to feed you, and they're going to pour their heart out into, into your life. And so we need connections, though. And maybe it was a neighbor, maybe it's, 
maybe it's your coach, maybe it's someone who invited you to a group or what it is, but somehow, some way or another, God will divinely um, make a divine appointment intersect in your life where you're going to need them in your life. <clears throat> I remember with, um, there's a couple guys, Frank, and some of you guys don't really even know them, but Frank Demoselli is one of them, Mike Rain is another one. It's like, I really, I first met them in the church. It's like, who are these guys? But I was drawn to them. I was drawn to them in, in a godly way, okay, not a crazy way. Just want to make that clear. It's like, Lord, what, who, who are these guys, and why, why did you bring them here? These are solid, what I came to find out, they're solid businessmen. They're solid entrepreneurs. Mike's a developer. Frank's in financial business. Um, and I didn't realize that they became really good, strong, solid brothers. We used to just meet at Starbucks every, every Monday and just pray and encourage each other and talk about the week. And just be, we just became, uh, there was a bond there. And w- what I found out is that, you know, the church is kind of like a business as well. And so they would help me understand some of the important aspects of doing business in, in, in ministry. It helped me out tremendously. Kept me from a lot of uh, things that I've, I could have gotten myself into. And I trusted them. Little did I know. See, because sometimes God brings people to help you stay strong and help you never quit. Or help you to just to see a different perspective. Or help you to understand, here's what I see that you probably don't see because you're right in the middle of it. And I love how God does those things. And if you're just constantly isolating yourself and not ever interacting with folks, well, you're never going to get that gift that God wants to use to get you to this next season in your life. Because the most common um, uh, excuse we, we hear is like, I don't want anybody in my business. Eh, I get it. I don't want anybody in my business either. But maybe sometimes God uses people to get in your business. Isn't that the truth? The very thing you're running away from, the very thing you don't want, could be the very thing that you need to get you to this next level in life. I'm an isolator. I love to hide. I love to just be by myself. Mm -mm, mm -hmm. Mm-mm. Anybody like that? Like, leave me alone, man. Come on. Like, God, why did you call me into the people business? If it wasn't for people, I'd be, it'd be awesome. <laughs> but this year, my word is um, appear, like appear. It's like, Lord, what in the world does appear mean? Well, it's easy for me to hide. It's easy for me just to, you know, my dad taught me just mind your own business. So you start hearing stuff and it's like, just stay out of the way. Just let me just get out of here. But now the challenge is up here, Marcus. When your wife's getting a little crazy and a little tense, it's easy just for me to just take a walk. Get on my bike or go just take a walk. It's like, no, stop, up here. I'm like, I'm going to appear. I'm going to appear in a way. I'm going to show her. Just appear, man, just appear. So I just began to start appearing. It's like showing up. And, man, I'm so thankful because I realize that it's not as bad as I think it is. And God begins to show me certain things. God begins to, to reveal things about me more than anything else. And so we need, we absolutely need connection. Let me give you some scripture. Um, Philip, you can go back to that one. Philip, remember Jesus calls the disciples. He says, hey, follow me. And usually immediately they begin to follow. Jesus calls Philip and Philip's like, I'll go, but just wait a minute. So he goes over and he finds Nathaniel. And Nathaniel goes, hey, man, I found the Lord. I found the Messiah. I found the guy that we've been talking about. And Nathaniel's sitting under a fig tree. He's like, eh, come on. We've been looking for him for a long time. Where is he from? He's from Nazareth. No, really, he's the Messiah. Like, there's nothing good that can come out of Nazareth. It's like, Philip, come on, man. I'm going to follow this guy. And one day, my name will be written in this book called the Bible. And you're going to be left out, dude. Come on. He didn't say that, but still, I'm just saying and so, so Nathaniel's like, okay, I'll get up. And when he goes and he, he invites, he, he, this connection, we're talking about connection, he invites him over and he comes face to face with Jesus and Jesus said, ah, a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. He's an honorable man. 
I was like, how do you know me? You never, you don't know who I am. He says, before uh, Philip called you, I saw you sitting under that fig tree. I know who you are. And Nathaniel's like, man, you are the Messiah. He goes, if you believe me just because I told you about the fig tree, you're going to believe me when you interact with me because you're going to see angels come up and down now as I'm demonstrating the kingdom of heaven here on this earth. And so he got a ringside seat. Nathaniel, you never really read uh, anything about Nathaniel after that. But you'll see, you, can you imagine? So Nathaniel's part of that crew. I'm sure after a year, two years, three years down the road, every now and then whenever they have a fire around the, around the pit or something, he would say, hey, Philip, man, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for connecting with me. I got to see things I would have never seen unless I would have just risen up in that moment and become a part of this. Right. Make sense? And so it's very important to get connected to the right people. Who knows? One connection, one saying yes to that person who's, who you really don't, is just kind of just disturbing you, that one connection could be the key that will catapult your faith into a whole other level. Good. Good. Just got to discern, find out what's the right thing. Philip finds Nathaniel. You remember um, um, God drops people in your life divinely. I don't know who that is, but here's how I would pray. God you know who I need and when I need them. Just be bold and take a risk and pray that way. And then just be alert, be sensitive to who that is. And he'll show you. God wants you to be where he wants you to be more than you want to be where you want to be. So you just got to, again, put your faith, put your trust in him. And sometimes God brings you someone and sometimes God's calling you to be that someone for that individual. I love how he does that. <clears throat> we need one another. The, uh, the author of Hebrews, notice what it says in the 10th chapter. I love this because when, when um, Paul, we, we think it was Paul who's the writer, when he was writing this, he was writing to Galileans and Judeans, and he was saying, don't you give up. They're having some hard times in that, in that season of their life. He goes, don't give up. You've got to hold fast. God's faithful. Who he said he is, you can, you can believe him. You can put your trust in him. And so he's encouraging them. That's, what, that's the writer of Hebrews writing in that context. And he says, let us not, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Don't you dare drift away. He goes, because he who promised is faithful. And he goes, and let's consider how we can stir up one another. While we're connected here, let's figure out how we can stir up one another to love, take the high road, and to get involved in the, the eternal things that this world demands, uh, that puts a demand on us. Is in, and for, and for, and for, for, don't neglect the meeting together as is the habit of some. In other words, it goes, stay close. You know why he wants us to stay close, connected to people? It's because proximity matters. Here's the reason why. Here's what we've seen in life, in ministry, in people, People will always drift away from their community before they drift away from their faith. True. They'll always drift away and they'll become isolated before they drift away from their faith. And people constantly are drifting away. But one of the reasons why is because they're not connected to a community of faith. A community of faith helps you grow your faith. This church, whether you realize it or not, is uh, established upon this rule that I got in my head. I don't know where I got it. I wish I could... You know where I got it from? I can't remember. But I call it the three-legged stool. The three-legged stool, when all the busyness of life and ministry, it's all bombarded, it's all just going crazy, it's chaotic. Church members are doing this, and stuff's happening here, and finances here, and just all kinds of stuff. It's like, man, I still got to get ready for Sunday. I got a funeral here. I got all this going on. So when I break it down, it's like, let, here are the things that really matter. It's a three-legged stool. A pure worship, just an authentic way to worship God, where we'll get into God's presence. Jeremiah does that, does a good job doing that. A good solid word, a practical application of God's word where we can feed you truth and give you application on how to implement that word in your life. And then connection is the third thing. Worship, the word, and relationships. That's why one of our core values here is relationships rule. Stay connected. Get involved and stay connected with individuals. They love you. Amen? Amen. It's important to stay connected. You guys got that? Yes. Sure. Some of you guys have come in from different cities, different states, 
and you're wondering, why in the heck am I here in Seguin? <laughs> Anybody feel that way? I ask myself that too. Like, what the heck am I doing here? You know why you're here? Because you ha- before you left this earth, you had to see an amazing Mexican pastor. That's what I- I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I lost my train of thought. Sorry. Connection. You need it. The other thing that you need right here is discipline. Dang, I got to run through that one fast because people don't like that one. But discipline. You know why? Habits matter. It's important to have habits in your life. When you hear faith stories, you'll hear stories like this. When when I began to read my Bible every day, when I began to pray or when I began to do this on a day, it became a habit in my life. All of a sudden, my faith grew leaps and bounds. We see that over and over again. So what are those habits? In Matthew, the sixth chapter, a few weeks ago, I just kind of just threw something out there as I was talking. And I said, you know what? God's watching. He's looking at you uh, intently in three areas of your life. Matthew, the sixth chapter. He looks at when you pray, because when you pray, don't be like these people that, with all these vain words and these repetitive words. And I don't know why it's, my ears are so big. <laughs> he looks at, he says, my father who, he sees you in secret when you're praying. And he'll reward you openly. He, he looks at when you're praying. He looks at when you are fasting. And fasting means not necessarily just neglecting food, but fasting is also is, is a time where you set yourself apart um, and focus on the things of God rather than the things that this earth has to offer. Seasons of that. Some people call that a Sabbath. Like my, my Sabbath or my focus and attention on a daily basis is, is my Sunday. Saturday, usually start Saturday. I'll spend all of my energy. I black out all of my calendar because I know that on Saturday I'm going to get ready for Sunday because Sunday I'm going to pour everything that I have in my heart and in my spirit to the people that God brings into this ministry. But he looks at when you fast, he looks at when you pray, and the other things he looks at, he looks at when you give. He says, what you do in secret, he'll reward openly. And so in my life, I've learned how to develop some habits, some consistent habits. Every day I pray. My, the, the first breath out of my mouth is not, hey, look at Facebook, let's see how many followers we have. <laughs> let's take a look at Monday morning, how many people logged on to YouTube so they can see how many people heard my message. It's not even a temptation. The first thing is like, Father, thank you that I woke up. I have breath, and I have this beautiful chick right here next to me. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hey, <laughs> worry about your own chick. <laughs> So that's one of my habits I develop. First breath, Father, I love you. Thank you for another day. In the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. It came from my Catholic background. Sometimes I'll just say the Lord's Prayer, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. <clears throat> it's important. My first dollar increase comes. First dollar goes to him. My first, whatever dollars that is, percentages. It's turned into percentages. It's not necessarily an amount. It's like, Lord, what do you want me to give this week? Lord, what do you want me to do this, this one? When increase comes, I've taught my grandkids, I've taught my children. Like, man, all promotion, all those blessings, every good and perfect, it comes from above. Just remember that. Don't ever forget that. Give him. Give back to him. Well, you don't understand. He goes, the church does all kinds of evil stuff. Don't worry, that's not your business. Your business is to honor God with the first fruits. They'll be accountable to before the Lord what's going to happen after that. But you're going to be accountable to what, you're, what he's asking you to do. Do you trust me? One of the best ways to get rid of greediness and covetousness is to become open-handed. I give everything away except my wife. I'll give my dog away. I'll give everything away. None of it's mine. And really, she's not mine, but she's mine. 
okay? Why? Because I know if I continue to withhold, it's, that's not good for me. I would just become consumed with, my, with me and my needs and my stuff. But I've noticed that every time I let go of stuff, man, the stuff that I wish I wanted comes. Does that make sense? Isn't that true? It's like a guy would drop by and it's like, hey, here's your car. I was like, I don't need a car. He goes, no, I, mean, I want you to have this BMW. I'm like, oh, man. Well, give it to your wife. Just ride it around for two years. I'm like, okay. You see stuff like that happens constantly. I want a condo by the ocean. I ain't got no money for no condo by the ocean. But somebody comes up and goes, Pastor Marcus, here's the keys to my condo at the ocean. You can use it whenever you want to. Like, do I have to pay taxes on it? <laughs> Seriously, over and over again. Why? I developed a habit. Keep sowing seed. Keep honoring. I don't do it so I can get. I do it because I love Jesus. I do it because I owe him everything. Give them your first minute, give them your first dollar, and then give them your first day. Well, I don't know what that day of the week is. Maybe it's Sunday. I have friends here in the church that, man, I love what they do. They've started doing, developing a habit that on Sunday they come, the family comes, they get together, they feel, they worship God, and then they go and play games or they go and do just different things as a family unit. They want to honor God with that day, and they do it with their family. It's so beautiful to see that. And you know what? Over time, they've been doing it. Over time, over time, I've seen not only their faith get stronger, but I've seen the influence that they have had, the impact that they have had on a whole generation. It's so amazing to see. But discipline is absolutely uh, important. So evaluate your first. And the last thing is fortitude. And I won't say a whole lot about this, but you will need this right here, baby. How do you say it in Spanish? Ganas, fortitude, resilience, fortaleza. I don't know, that's right, even a word. <laughs> you need some grit, man. I'm telling you, one of the common things that we see in life is that a tragedy has struck. Some of the most devastating things that can deter people away from their faith happens. And you know what the key component is, what we see? The key component is, is that when, it's not like it's not going to happen. It's going to happen. I just, I just prayed with a brother here just a few minutes ago. I won't mention his name. But I just prayed with someone who just happened to be driving and hit someone and they pass away. Can you imagine the weight of that, the burden of that? It wasn't his fault. It just happens. I don't know what to say in those moments, but tragedy will strike every single one of us at some time or another. And here's the key thing. What you believe and who you're connected with are absolutely vital when it happens. What you believe, and that's why we try to do what we do here. We just pour it in, pour it in, pour it in week after week. Stay faithful, pour it in. Because this, is, this doesn't happen in a weekend. This doesn't happen in a 30-minute message. This happens over time, just being consistent and staying faithful over and over again. Amen? That's why I told you guys last week. I don't know if I told you all or not, but it's like my, my habit is you, you reach, you teach, you train, you send. Just keep doing that, Marcus. Teach, reach, teach, train, send. That's my next phase. You know what I'll be doing next year, right? I'm going to be reaching. I'm going to be teaching. I'm going to be training. I'm going to be sending. Why? Because I know that whenever I'm doing that, people are going to find themselves in crazy situations. And the consistency of just reaching to them in those moments, teaching them God's word, serving them, training them, helping them to get out and rise up above that circumstance that, that they're facing is vital to their lives as well. It all works together. Courage. You and I are going to need courage in our lives. I love C.S. Lewis's quote. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. It's important to have fortitude. Your faith will be tested. It happened in Peter's life. It happened in Jesus' life. Here's, here's the defining moment. I remember when I was a kid, I mean, early 20s. Here's where, where the defining moment was. 
is when I saw Jesus, well, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. I'm like, man, even Jesus was tested. Even Jesus was tried. Even Jesus went through the fire. And what I loved about it was not that he went into the fire, that the Holy Spirit led him into that place, but when he came out, because faith that is not tested cannot be trusted. And it says when Jesus came out, it says he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I knew that. I took comfort in that. It's like, man, Lord, whatever hell or high water comes my way, I'm going to put my faith in you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to use God's word. I'm going to hold myself. I'm going to have fortitude and resilience because I know if I press on through this thing on the other side of that, I'll get stronger. I'll get stronger. I don't know if that's a determining factor for you, but it was for me. I'm like, I am determined not to move. Natalie can leave, but I'm going to follow her. I'm determined not to move. I'm the steadiness, the rock. And I learned that from my dad. But that's who I am, just over and over and over again. Why? Because you and I need to have resilience in our walk in faith. Amen. Just because somebody offends you in the church, like, hey, rise above that. Lee, the guy, Levi, the guy, he's always offending me. But he's still up here playing. I just saw you walk in. That's why I said that. People rub you the wrong way constantly. But rise above that. You got to have resilience. Amen. So here's my application. I need you to evaluate your life this week, this summer. You know where you're at. Evaluate and ask yourself, hey, out of these, am I missing any of these things right here? Like, where am I at in my life? You know what? I know what God's telling me to do, but I need the courage to go and step out in faith. Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm isolating myself too much. I need, I need connection in my life. Man, I'm growing weaker. It says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Man, I keep tripping over the same thing. My strength is small. I need a little bit of fortitude. I need to get back into the daily disciplines in my life and put these things in my heart. You know where you're at. Find out where you're at. Locate yourself. Be honest with yourself. One of these things will probably, he's probably just pointing his fingers like, hey, take care of this. In this season of your life, you need to focus on this. And you'll see yourself do this over and over and over. Next thing you know, you're going to be 58 years old like me. And you'll be like, man, thank God I obeyed that. Thank God I took care of that. Amen. Amen. Let me pray with you. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we love you. I thank you for this congregation. I thank you, Lord God, for the families that you're bringing here. And I thank you, Lord God, that uh, you're getting them stronger and stronger and stronger in their faith and their trust with you. We have confidence in you, Father God. And we make a commitment not to ever allow what's wrong in life to keep us from worshiping and looking at what's right about you. You're good to us. And so I thank you to give us strength Give us the tenacity, the fortitude on the inside, Lord God, to rise above this situation that we're facing in life and just give you honor and glory in the midst of it. We put our trust in you in Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said amen. Hey, don't miss next week. We love you. Make sure you come and support Pastor. It's going to be a fantastic series. But let's all stand. Before you leave, let them finish this song, okay? Because I want to go out there and greet some of you guys. Thank you, Pastor. You're incredible. You really are. How was that meal? That was great. My soul is fed. How about yours? Before we remind ourselves again how good God is, I just want to let you know there's on the screen there's going to be ways to give. Uh, you're giving. God doesn't need our money, but uh, he loves to work in our lives when we trust him. And, and I've, I've gone by this, and it's never let me down, that God can do more with my 90% than... I ever could with a hundred. So test him in that and see what he does. And there's ways to give on the screen while we sing this next song. Let's just remind ourselves how good God is again. You are good. You can only be good. You can't be anything else. You can't be anything else. You can only be good. It can't be anything else. It can't be anything else. Sing it again. You are good. You can only be good. You can't be anything else. You can't be anything else. You are 
good You can only be good You can't be anything else You can't be anything else I love you, have a great week I'll see you next Sunday If you are ever in the Seguin area Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.